are continuing in our journey in the book of Mark. Today we'll be in Mark 3, 20 through 28. The version that we will be having on your screen today is from the Passion. It is a translation, much like the New International Version, just using words that are more common to our um, vernacular today. Verse 26. Then Jesus went home once again. A large crowd gathered around him, which prevented him from even eating a meal. When his own family heard that he was there, they went out to seize him, for they said, he is insane. The religious scholars who arrived from Jerusalem were saying, Satan has possessed him. He casts out demons by the authority of the prince of demons. Jesus called them to himself and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? No kingdom can endure if it is divided against itself. And a splintered household will not be able to stand, for it is divided. And if Satan fights against himself, he will not endure, and his end has come. Jesus said to them, Listen, no one is able to break into a mighty man's house and steal his property unless he is first powers, he overpowers the mighty man and ties him up. Then his entire house can be plundered and his possessions taken. I tell you this timeless truth. All sin will be forgiven, even all the blasphemies they speak. But there can never be forgiveness for the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. For he is guilty of an eternal sin. This is because they had said he was empowered by a demon spirit. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came and stood outside and sent him a message, asking him that he would come out and speak with them. When the crowd sitting around Jesus heard this, they spoke up and said to him, Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. He answered them saying, who is my true mother and my true brothers? Then looking in the eyes of those who were sitting in a circle around him, he said, here are my true family, my true family members. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's funny how we can remember things and how well something from 12 years ago can stick in your head, but then again, something from yesterday just washes away. And I think it has to do with the power of what that moment meant in time for you. There's a moment like this in my life that I was reminded of as I read this scripture from Jesus. It was when my family and I, my, my two sons, Joe, and my sisters, and my mother, and my sister's families, their kids, and their husbands all went to the mountains of California to lay my grandfather to rest. He had died, and we had had him cremated, and we were taking his ashes to where he was born, which was north of where we lived in San Diego. And we were all together in this camping lodge type area, and I would say that I was maybe three years post being baptized, so kind of new to my really living out my faith, making faith an everyday part of my life, making my following Jesus a big part of who I was. And as we were together, one of my family members said um, some uh, foul language. It's kind of just kind of who we were and the way that we interacted with each other. And as soon as they said it, they looked up at me kind of with these big eyes and they said, oh, man sorry, I'm trying not to do that so much anymore, now that you're such a holy roller. Straighten my face. Now that I was such a holy roller, which honestly is an interesting way to um, describe a Christian, but I was such a holy roller, they were going to try not to cuss so much around me. And I'll never forget those words. I'll never forget the impact that it had on me. In the moment, I think it was more of a negative impact. I remember thinking, man, I'm not judging you. I'm not trying to judge you. I just want to be your family member like I've always been your family member. I love you like I've always loved you. Just because I'm on this journey doesn't mean I'm judging you for not being on the same journey. But now as I look back at that time, I see it as a win. 
And the reason why I see it as a win, not because it created some sort of separation, because obviously there was a separation between me and my natural family that didn't exist before. A separation that didn't exist before I had accepted Christ into my life. A separation that didn't exist before I had started really living like Christ. And yes, that separation was true and real. And perhaps it was somewhat painful. But as I look back, What that moment really was to me was an indication that I was following Jesus. That I was following Jesus in such a way that my life was starting to look different. That I was starting to look different. That without really noticing it myself or without trying to project myself as anything different, the people around me, the people who knew me best, were noticing my difference. And even though they misunderstood that difference, which they did, they they saw that difference as being something that should separate us. They perhaps saw that difference as something that was judgmental towards them, which it wasn't. And I felt a little ugly or gross because of that misunderstanding. At the same time, it was a markation that I was doing something that made me closer to Jesus and further away from the world that I had known. And it's interesting when we do this. It's interesting to follow Jesus. It's an interesting path. Jesus himself felt these same sort of tensions in his own journey. And that's what we see happening here in Mark 3. We see the same sort of tension. It's a lot of tension. This section, this passage that we're looking at is rife with tension. It's a sandwich type of verse. And what I mean by sandwich is that it begins with Jesus and his family and ends with Jesus and his family. And then there's inserted into that sandwich a layer of the teachers of the law. So we have the bread, which is his family, and then we have two slices of cheese, one on each end, which is the teachers of the law, two encounters with them. And then in the middle, we kind of have the meat, which is Jesus's response Jesus' um, ways of speaking in parable in response to their reactions to Jesus' way of interacting with the world. And so we're going to kind of um, unstack this sandwich, this tension sandwich, and see what it means to us. See how Jesus encounters this. See how Jesus is active being misunderstood, because really he's being misunderstood throughout the scripture. And how that translates to us today in our life, in our life in our community, in our life in our family structures, in our life in our personal journey with Christ. So let's begin on the outer layers. The beginning of this passage starts with um, Jesus entering a house. And I don't know what just happened there, but we're going to pretend that everything's just normal. We good? We're good. So we start with Jesus is entering a house. And it says that as Jesus entered this house, a crowd gathered. And it was so big, this crowd, that Jesus and the disciples were not even able to eat. So Jesus, in just a few chapters that Mark has introduced Jesus to us, has become really kind of like a rock star in today's world. You know, stars uh, in our world can't really go anywhere without people following them, without people wanting an autograph or a picture, without people surrounding them. And that's what's happening to Jesus. Everywhere Jesus goes, the stories of Jesus, the stories of Jesus healing, the stories of Jesus casting out demons, the stories of Jesus loving and wanting to be with people that normally people don't want to be with, have followed him everywhere he's going. And so people are clamoring to be with Jesus wherever he goes. So much so that he and his disciples can't even take a meal because the people are so close to them. Imagine what that must feel like. I mean, I get claustrophobia just thinking about it. And in today's world where we're used to six feet of distance between us and other people, I mean, the people, Jesus literally has people pressing up against him at all times. And what his family sees is that this Jesus who was with them for 30-some years, this Jesus who was their son, their brother, just this normal guy, a carpenter, is all of a sudden creating a big stir, is creating a lot of noise, is making the teachers of the law very uncomfortable and very nervous. 
He's saying things that people really don't understand, but at the same time are mad about. And so his family is starting to get very nervous. And as soon as his family sees all of this, fa- this happening, they go to where Jesus is and they try to take possession of him. That's literally what it says here. It says his family heard about this and they went to take charge of him like you would of somebody who's having mental health issues. They went to take charge of his life, to bring him home, to force him to come home so they could shelter him from making any other bad decisions, so they could shelter him from making any other bad um, impressions in the society that they were living in. You see, the family was not only worried about Jesus, because I'm sure they were genuinely worried about Jesus, but they were also worried about their reputation in this community. You see, we lived, they lived in a different world than we live in today, a world where their tradition was very much steeped in years and hundreds upon years of uh, history, of tradition. And Jesus kept turning these histories and traditions on their end. And as he did that, he made people angry. And so the only reason that they thought that this could be happening was that their son, their brother, had become insane, literally insane. It wasn't just a figure of speech. They thought Jesus had become insane, which is interesting. I mean, you could kind of understand that, but on the other hand, you have Mary, Jesus' mother, who was visited by the angel Gabriel and told that her son was going to be the Messiah, the one who would save the whole world, right? You would think that she would understand that things might be different because, well, Jesus is different. But somehow, the things that he he is doing is so far outside of what they are expecting that they can't even comprehend it. That even knowing, Mary, even knowing that Jesus was going to be different, even knowing that God sent Jesus specifically to do a specific work, she couldn't help but thinking that he had gone insane. That's our first layer of tension. Then the next layer of tension are these teachers of the law. These are the people who work in the, in the synagogues, the people who have studied the law, the people who are highly regarded in this society. These people were not just teachers of the local synagogue. These were teachers of the Jerusalem synagogue. That means that they had to travel 120 miles to get from Jerusalem to where they are today. Now, that's not driving in a car. That's not even really riding on animals. They had to travel by foot, sometimes maybe riding a camel or a donkey, but really they were traveling in a way that is so foreign to us. It was a huge decision to make this journey to see this unknown man who was causing all of this trouble in this one small town. They really must be thinking he was doing something incredibly terribly bad. They really must have seriously believed that he was possessed by Satan or or simply that what this man was doing threatened everything they believed in. And so they traveled all this way. They stood in front of all of these people and said before this group of people that Jesus was possessed by Beelzebul, by by Satan. And so Jesus, the man who has spent all of his working ministry so far with his disciples, hears this. Can you imagine being one of Jesus' disciples and hearing not only his family say that he's insane, but also hearing that the teachers of the law, the people that you had put on a pedestal, trust me, they had put these people on a pedestal. They believed everything these people said. These people calling Jesus a worker of Satan. How hard must it have been for the disciples to stay with Jesus, to support Jesus during this trial, when everyone around them was calling Jesus crazy? And so this this segment, this piece, is surrounded in tension. And right in the middle of it, Jesus speaks back to them in parables, knowing, knowing that you can't speak truth to people who don't understand the truth. 
You can't just say, I'm not doing these things that you're telling me I'm doing. I'm not Satan. I'm not insane. I mean, when you're misunderstood, have you ever tried to speak truth to somebody who misunderstands you? In my experience, they've only taken my words and twisted them up even more. It's so hard to speak truth to people who don't understand what's happening, who have their version of the story, and they just want to stick to that version of the story. So Jesus chooses to speak in parable form truth into the light, into the darkness, so there might be a little bit of light, knowing knowing that he wasn't going to fix the situation, knowing that there was no way to change the minds of either his family or of the teachers. And what he says is that there's no way for him to be Satan. It's not possible, because he's been doing work that acts against Satan. He's been doing work that casts Satan out of people's bodies. There's no way for this house to be divided against itself. And he said, in fact, the only way for Satan to be overtaken is for a strong man to get a hold. And what he's really saying there is that he's that strong man. That Jesus is that strong man that's gotten hold of Satan and is rooting and is pillaging the world of Satan. And see, they're parables. They're not easy to understand, but Jesus is trying to, in a guided, um, in a veiled way, share what the truth is but at the same time knowing that there's no way to change the minds of these two groups of people. And on the other side of this sandwich, on the other side of truth, the teachers of the law know he's Satan. They're certain. There's no changing their mind. And then again, we see his family calling to him, begging him to come and speak with them. And we see Jesus resolve the tension by saying something that is very, very shocking in this culture. And let me describe why it's so shocking. You see, what Jesus has done all of this time is turn the understanding of the Jewish people upside down. You see, Jesus talked about the Sabbath like we talked last week and said the Sabbath was not, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath made for man, meaning it's not a law that we have to follow, it's a grace given to us to help us grow to know God better. He said the same about fasting. Yes, fasting is a good thing, but it's not something that we have to do in the way that you've created it to be. What you're doing is wrong, he said. He also ate with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors. He made his work about being around people who were hurting and broken and needed his presence. Something that was not ever done by Jewish leaders, by Jewish people who wanted to maintain their cleanliness so that they could go about the job of being in the synagogue. Everything Jesus did turned the regular way of living upside down. And the final thing that Jesus says here does exactly that again. The way that Jesus works to dissolve this tension only actually increases the tension more because what Jesus says when the people say that his mother and brothers are waiting for him, Jesus says, who are my mother and brothers? You, my friends, as he looks them directly in the eye, you, my friends, are my mother and my brothers. Now, we have to be so careful here. Jesus is not saying that his mothers and brothers aren't, his mother and brothers aren't worthy of love, that he doesn't love his mother and brothers. He isn't saying that he doesn't love his, his natural family. What Jesus is doing is taking the way that the Jewish tradition put blood above all else and turning that upside down. What Jesus is doing here is telling us that God goes first, and then our community of believers. They become our first family, because it's in this first family that we learn how to live and move and breathe. We learn how to transform into the people that we are called to be. We learn how to follow the path that Jesus has set before us. We learn how to transform. 
We learn how to live the way that God has created us to live. We learn how to live on this upside down world that Jesus is creating. You see, you and I, those of us who have claimed Christ in our lives, we are meant to live in an upside down world. We are meant to live transformed. But unfortunately, most of us become Christians and then try to fit our Christianity into our already um, living and being, our already existing patterns of life. Sometimes that existing pattern includes church the way that church has always been. It includes work the way that work has always been. It includes life the way that life has always been. It includes achievement the way achievement has been laid out for us by the world. We take our Christianity and try and fit it into the mold that the world has given to us instead of letting Christianity break that mold completely, turn it upside down, and teach us how to live anew. You see, the claim to glory in our life should be when we are misunderstood like Jesus is misunderstood here. We are meant to be misunderstood. We are meant to be transformed in such a way that we are no longer understood completely by those who are no longer following, who aren't following the same path that we are following. Which is one of the reasons why I think we as Christians globally are not doing the work that we are meant to do. There are people hurting and in need of knowing God and they don't get to know God because we are still trying to do things in the same cookie-cutter way that was done for years and years and years. Because it's comfortable to us. Because we are comfortable in that rhythm, in that system. And that's what the Jewish tradition was trying to do. They were trying to maintain their traditions. They were trying to maintain their rhythms. Because they believed that the traditions and the rhythms were the things that were most important. And Jesus said, no, no. Following me is what's most important. Following what God lays out before us is most important. People are most important. Love is most important. Giving our faith away is most important. Jesus was misunderstood, and he didn't try to fix that. He didn't make a big deal about it either. He just continued to live on as he was called to live, transforming day by day the lives of those around him who chose to follow him. And you and I have a choice to make. As we live with Jesus, we need to really examine our lives and see, are we transforming daily? It doesn't matter how old or how young we are, we are called to be transforming every day until the day that we die. Is our faith the same faith that it was yesterday? Is it the same faith that it was a year ago? If it is, we're not engaged the way Jesus wants us to be engaged. We need to be willing to follow the path that Jesus has put before us. We need to be willing to be misunderstood sometimes. Because then as we look back, we can see that that was us following the path of Jesus. We won't be perfect. I'm not perfect. I mess up so often. But my goal is to follow. My goal is to try my hardest to step outside of the box that is most comfortable for me in order to follow the one who went before me so that others can know the love of Jesus. Because that's the calling. Not that I would be comfortable. Not that I would have a rhythm. Not that I would have a system to follow in my life. But that I would go and follow so that others can know the love of God, and follow, and then share the love of God. So our challenge for us today is to look forward to being misunderstood. Our challenge for us today is to look forward to being called holy rollers once in a while, knowing that what we're doing is transforming on the inside, letting Jesus change us bit by bit, and then going out into the world and sharing that love with those who desperately need it. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much. 
for the ministry of Jesus, for the way that Jesus was not afraid to push back against the rituals and the rhythms and the traditions that people hold on to so tightly because they're so comfortable. God, we pray that you help us to be courageous enough to look at those rituals and traditions and rhythms in our lives and help us to push against them in such a way that you are calling us to so that those who don't know you may know you, so that those who know you a little may know you more, and so that those who know you a lot may know you even more. God, we need to be a group who's willing to live in an upside-down world. Help us to learn to do that better by following the path that Jesus paved. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.